Welcome to this ultimate A-level guide to Jeanette Winterson's Oranges Are Not The Only Fruits. By watching this video, you're going to develop your understanding of the novel and significantly increase your chances of getting a top grade in that exam. I'm going to start off by exploring characters. First, first of all, the narrator herself, who, although she's called Jeanette, is emphatically not an autobiographical version of the writer. We'll then go on to that monster of a mother and then that father that doesn't really exist. Next up, it's going to be kind Elsie Norris and then those two lesbian lovers, Melanie and Katie. As the video goes on, I'm then going to shift to themes, explore the presentation of religion, look at love and marriage. It's going to be incredibly useful. Stay tuned and watch Schofield on Shakespeare. We're going to build a palace and we'll be so proud. A palace where the roar of the crowd will tell the world our palace will last. Whilst I would recommend watching this video in sequential order, as some ideas are built upon lead on more seamlessly to others, you can also skip to a section of your choice by clicking on the relevant hyperlink within the description box below. First up, Jeanette, who Winterson is keen to stress, is not strictly an autobiographical version of herself, in spite of having the same name and very similar upbringings. Sounding a little like she may have a chip on her shoulder, she argues. If I call myself Jeanette, why must I be writing an autobiography? Henry Miller calls his hero Henry. Paul Oster and Milan Kundra call themselves by name in some of their work. So does Philip Roth. This is understood by critics as playful metafiction. For a woman, it is assumed to be confessional. Why shouldn't a woman be her own experiment? So what is this experiment like and how do we as readers respond to her? Well, as a young child, she is a devout evangelical Pentecostal Christian. How can she be anything else given the way her mother has trained and built her? With no friends her own age and belated exposure to school, she's like her mother in that she sees and understands the world purely in terms of how it relates to religious experience. She has an intimate knowledge of the Bible and can reference it appropriately or inappropriately at any point, including when under terrible pressure. However, as a child, she initially has no idea that other children have had very different upbringings in which religious belief has played, if anything at all, a far more marginal role. Thus, when she finally starts school, tantalizingly and mysteriously referred to by her mother as a breeding ground, she finds herself quickly alienated from the other children and teachers who feel threatened by and unable to understand her exclusively religious outlook. It is Jeanette's instinctive, conversational use of the semantic field of religion, which particularly unsettles those outside her church family, her use of the noun crusade being a prime example. Crusades are mostly associated with bloody religious wars fought by Christians in the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. And using this term in the late 20th century conjures up images of in-your-face medieval extremism, something very much counter to the mild wishy-washy can't offend anyone Church of England Christianity, which the majority in the UK have been prepared to countenance and even notionally support at Christmas or for the particularly zealous Easter for decades. As a young child, she sticks out a mile at school. Notably with the phrase she sews onto her sampler for her cross stitch projects. And her dire, well meant ish warnings of doom in the playground. She is an outsider. Albeit one content with her life in the church. Thus, it is one of the tragedies of the novel that she is ultimately spat out and discarded by her church community. 
following her refusal to repress her natural, vibrant lesbian feelings and desires. At school, she is the other, due to her exclusively religious frame of reference, which the majority find plain weird. And then, as a teenager, she is rejected by her own religious community, which contributes the loss of her faith and leaves her a solitary, a yearning figure. Winterson is at pains to stress the naturalness and naivety of Jeanette's lesbianism. From a young age, this potential inability for her to conform to restrictive, bigotive, heterosexual norms is hinted at by a gypsy. Her repulsion of the male body and the initial innocence and purity of her relationship with Melanie. Whereas Mrs. Winterson feels that her adopted daughter's lesbian desires are a, a willful act on her part to sell her soul, the narrator stresses the spirituality of Jeanette's relationships with both Melanie and Katie, both in terms of their deep intuitive connection but also that they simultaneously continue to cherish their relationship with God. Note also how Winterson deliberately paraphrases the language of creation from Genesis when she writes that it was evening and it was morning another day following the commencement of Jeanette and Melanie's physical intimacy. The implication behind this is that the birth of their sexual relationship is something new, precious, beautiful, and utterly natural, as wonderful as God's creation of heaven, earth, lights, and living creatures. There are hints early on of Jeanette's latent lesbianism, and there are also early hints of her feisty, non-conformist, more subversive side, which comes to the surface later in the novel. When she takes on Pastor Spratt during his disgraceful denunciation, and gobs on Melanie's fiance. As a younger child, she almost strangled her dog with rage, enjoys drowning the detachable chimpanzee from Elsie's Noah's Ark, and tweaked a key biblical scene so that this man of God ended up being swallowed by a lion. As a feminist writer, it is not only repressive heterosexual norms which Winterson is seeking to undermine, but gender stereotypes too. The reference to the near strangulation of Jeanette's dog is only given to explain an objection to her younger self being called sweet. Sweet heart for a sweet heart cries the presumably well-meaning but ill-judging man who runs the post office. But objections to gender stereotyping aside, and under the proviso that both girls and boys can potentially be sweets, my impression of the young Jeanette in the novel is that actually she is fundamentally a kind, well-meaning, decent child, that actually she is sweet. For vast swathes of the novel, she wants to obey her mother and become a missionary. She wants to connect and confide in her mother. She wants to love her, but this is tricky when the mother is Mrs. Winterson. Where to start? Well, in 2015, Winston talked about her real mother in a BBC Radio 3 interview. She was a monster, uh, but she was my monster. It is certainly very easy to dismiss her fictional creation in Oranges as the most appalling person and mother who fails abysmally to prepare Jeanette for the outside world and is proud of doing so, who shows no empathy following the uncovering of Jeanette's lesbian relationships, 
who uses violence against her and publicly disowns her at a point when she is really from the death of one of her very few loyal friends, Elsie. And all of this is true, of course. And there's also the moment she violates Jeanette's privacy following the exposure of her relationship with Melanie. There is a sense that this particular personal act of betrayal broke something irretrievably within the pair's relationship. Hence the subsequent sentence that she burnt a lot more than the letters that night in the backyard. Towards the very end of the novel, when Jeanette meets new bovine to vegetable mother Melanie, she is more dismissive about the value of letters. Yet there seems to be an element of bravado here, faced with the smug, conveniently rebaptized heterosexual. Mrs. Winterson's burnings of Jeanette's personal items fit seamlessly into her invariably destructive style of parenting, in which love, common sense and kindness are jettisoned, for Jeanette must become a missionary and nothing must get in the way. When Mrs. Winterson adopted her, her plan was that she would get a child, train it, build it, dedicate it to the Lord. And she cannot, will not, must not deviate from this plan. Yet this quotation hints at the inhumanity of this proposal. With the Asinderton, there is no room or time to breathe or reflect, whilst the pronoun it similarly dehumanises and neutralises any potential for male or female identification. But there is no question about Mrs. Winterson's authenticity and energy as a Christian. Her biblical modifications notwithstanding, and her desire to make a difference to the world in which she lives, whether one would want to live in a Mr. Winterson changed world is another matter. She works tirelessly for her church and in her efforts to convert what she calls the heathen. From her catering efforts to her willingness to take on administrative responsibilities in the church. From her hoarding of tins to prepare for a holocaust. To her embracing new technology to spread the word. This is a woman who is unquestionably and wholeheartedly dedicated to her faith. Her faith is an all-consuming fire, and her criticisms of Jeanette invariably stem partly from her fear that her daughter may be jeopardising her chance of eternal life for an eternity in hell. Her criticisms are never personal, but are persistently cloaked in religious terminology. Notably, the euphemistic phrase, unnatural passions, Anything to avoid saying the dirty words of homosexuality or lesbianism. But I think the picture is more complicated than just evil mother, crazy religious bitch. Although it's true that she doesn't give Jeanette the support she needs, I don't think she can. She's not able to. When Jeanette is in hospital for an operation to have her adenoids out, Mrs. Winterson's reaction is telling when the former starts to cry. My mother looked horrified and rooted in her handbag, she gave me an orange. Throughout the novel, time and time again, it is shown that Jeanette's mother doesn't know how to deal with strong emotions, with the giving of an orange symbolising both her abdication of emotional responsibility but also her attempts to offer something approaching sweet tasting consolation. Jeanette's birth mother pitches up, resulting in a scene between Mrs. Winterson and her adopted daughter. The former hits out and Jeanette runs out of the house to scream and cry out in frustration. When she returns, her mother was watching television. She never spoke of what had happened and neither did I. Similarly, much later in the novel, when Jeanette returns for Christmas a few years after moving out, there is no question of any difficult topics being broached. 
Her first line is a friendly-ish. Come and look at this. It's especially for the electronic organ. And Jeanette is left later on to muse. My mother was treating me like she always had. Had she noticed my absence? Did she even remember why I'd left? But although she clearly cannot engage with her daughter on a deeper emotional level, she clearly cares about her during the Christmas visit in which both are adults. We spoke for a while of what I was doing and why. No detail, just enough to make both of us feel like we were making an effort. This may not be satisfactorily demonstrative for a 21st century social media infused palette, but given the abhorrence with which Mrs. Winterson views Jeanette's homosexual leanings, this neutral conversation does seem to indicate that she is accepting her daughter as a person and a member of her family. Yes, she can't resist snipes on Christmas Eve after Jeanette wins a game of Beetle, but the fact she has allowed her back into her house without causing a scene shows a surprising degree of acceptance given past acrimony. When Jeanette was a child, she would provide something approaching comfort and succour to her daughter in the early hours of the morning. She spent a lot of time with Jeanette and was well-meaning in some of her albeit inadequate acts of parenting. She shared a surprisingly intimate story with her daughter about a love affair with a Frenchman called Pierre. And she did so because she wanted to protect her daughter against premature, potentially disastrous pregnancy and or sinful immorality. Of course, she is barking up the wrong tree there but her intention was unquestionably well meant. And there were also hints that Mrs. Winderson may have repressed some homosexual leanings of her own. She goes to extraordinary lengths to reduce the amount of time she spends in the same bed as her husband's. And her repugnance towards sex is implied within the narrator's wryly comic tongue-in-cheek description of her attitude towards the Virgin Mary. She has a photo of a woman included within the Old Flame section of her photo album and responds suspiciously when asked about it. There is also confirmed lesbian Mrs. Jewsbury's rather enigmatic comment to Jeanette following the latter's persecution in church after the relationship with Melanie has been exposed. She describes Mrs. Winderson as a woman of the world, even though she'd never admit it to me. She knows about feelings, especially women's feelings. A teenage Jeanette may not want to go into this, but the reader most certainly does and is left to speculate. The phrase woman of the world implies an understanding of the broader, different roles and behaviour that women can adapt in their quest for fulfilment. Whilst the emphasis on women's feelings may also point to past closeness, perhaps even intimacies, albeit probably non-physical, of a non-heterosexual nature. May her disgust towards Jeanette's lesbianism be triggered not just by her firm belief that it is against God's will, but also by a shamed recognition that she herself shared and crushed similar feelings in the past. Now on to Mr. Winterson, and you will be unsurprised to hear that this section of the video will be far shorter. In 2010, Winterson took part in a BBC Radio 4 Lovin to celebrate the 25-year anniversary of the publication of the novel. Responding to a question from the audience about the marginal role of Mr Winterson in the novel, she responded... Look, in a northern working class community, the women run the show. That's how it is, and I think that's how it still is. Irrespective of the truth of this typically Winterson sweeping generalisation, there remains a difference between the women running the show and the presentation of a father and husband who could not be more passive if he tried. 
he is totally dominated by his wife in every aspect of his life. And thus it is no surprise that Jeanette finds it easy and natural to offer solace to attractive new friend Melanie by saying that she didn't have a father either. On the one occasion he goes against his wife's authority and doctrine by watching television on a Sunday while she is out, he is caught. And it is clear that Jeanette expects one almighty scene. Even after his wife has smashed every single plate in the kitchen after hearing of Jeanette's resumption of homosexuality, something which presumably he is going to need to pay to replace, he says nothing and simply trots off to procure some dinner at a fish and chip counter. This is not a man, but someone fully deserving of the neutral pronoun it within Winterson's famously withering eye-catching phrase. A man is a man wherever you find it. <laughs> I know, you didn't do very well 25 years ago, I admit. But you know what? I've mellowed. Things have been... <laughs> I understand but have more. Have you mellowed or have they mellowed? <laughs> They're still the same. <laughs> but some of my best friends are men. Whereas Mrs Winterson likes to wrestle, Elsie Norris is a kinder sort as well as playing the role of a surrogate mother by visiting Jeanette every day in hospital following her adenoids drama, she offers much needed public and private support following the exposure of Jeanette's relationship with Melanie. The former is seen in a prayer meeting in which the pastor and then Mrs. Winterson have declared that Jeanette's perversities have stemmed from women having too much power in the church. Elsie calls out, that's a load of old twaddle and you know it. Now, are we helping this child or not? Before falling over. She's only just come out from a sustained period of time in hospital. And indeed, she doesn't have that long left to live. Private support is seen in the way she understands Jeanette instinctively. And accepts her for who she is. And yet Elsie is a devout member of the same religious group which has created the monster that is Mrs. Winterson. Indeed, the extent of her devotion is highlighted in the fact she has the nickname Testifying Elsie. Due to her willingness to share everyday ordinary examples of God's willingness to help members of his flock. Jeanette's devotion to her throughout her life is seen in the fact that her school cross-stitch project is for her rather than her mother. And in the way she lovingly cleans her hearse. Before spending hours and hours with her dead body until daylight, Elsie is Jeanette's only friend in the entire novel, unless we count her two lovers, Katie and first, Melanie. Melanie first appears boning kippers on a fish stall, and it is clear that Jeanette quickly becomes drawn to her, without quite realising that she may have fallen in love at first sight. Following an initial innocuous exchange, in which Jeanette must have been quite a sight in a huge pink plastic mac, Jeanette begins to spend an increasing amount of time thinking about Melanie. She returns every week to the fish stall for her Melanie fix and is left bereft when one week the object of her idolatry is no longer working there. Fortunately, Melanie returns to the vicinity following her shift at the library and so Jeanette is able to upgrade her position from creepy Melanie gazer to Melanie friend. Jeanette invites Melanie to attend a church service. Is there an early sign that Melanie may be aware of some dormant lesbian stirrings following her reaction to Pastor Finch's dramatic revelations about unnatural passions in Cheadle Hume? Nonetheless, like Jeanette, she is characterised very much by her sexual innocence and desire to be good. She thrusts her hand in the air when Pastor Finch asks whether anyone would like to receive forgiveness from God. And every Monday she reads the Bible with Jeanette. 
in terms of the book as a whole, she interests in terms of how her reaction to the exposure of her relationship differs to Jeanette's and how she subsequently seems to renounce any homosexual inclinations and indeed arguably vibrant female identity through marriage and child rearing, much to Jeanette's fury. Winterson would clearly like the reader to see her as a victim or perhaps a proponent of prejudicial patriarchy. She presents her change of tack as a cop-out, a smug, belated signing up to societal norms and is withering in her description of her following her announcement of her engagement. The adjective bovine, meaning connected with animals from the cattle group, is unusual and is repeated again in Ruth. The suggestion would appear to be that Melanie has morphed self-righteously from a passionate individual, prepared to act and think for herself, into a larger, placid, cow-like receptacle, perfect for expressing milk and giving birth. The suggestion from the narrator is that she has lost her vibrancy and has become a cloned, heterosexual boar. God spare us from such like. Katie escapes a similar indictment and is said the narrator describes her as being the most uncomplicated love affair and I loved her because of it. The pair first meet in Blackpool and Jeanette's early interest is seen when she writes... Katie sat in a deck chair and Katie looked at the sun. Katie ate an ice cream and Katie looked like fun. There is the distinctive and mildly erotic repetition of the object of attraction's name rather than the more conventional resort to the personal pronoun. Whilst there is also a playful, subversive nursery rhyme feel, subversive in that the main character will soon be the recipient of lesbian kisses rather than the more traditional safe patriarchal fare. However, as with the relationship with Melanie, the narrator is at pains to suggest the wholesome naturalness of the relationship. Katie joins in wholeheartedly with the various activities organised by Jeanette's church and even types out Jeanette's sermons when they had to go in the district newsletter. When their relationship is eventually discovered by Mrs. Butler, the owner of the Morecambe Guest House and so-called friend of Jeanette's mother, Jeanette comes up with an elaborate plan which aims to spare Katie but sacrifice herself. Katie had simply helped Jeanette arrange a further rendezvous with old flame Melanie rather than got involved herself. Part of Jeanette's reasoning for this was that Katie was stubborn and angry like me, but unlike me, she couldn't cope with the darker side of our church. I'd seen her kick against it before, seen her kick and cry. So, as with the breakup of Jeanette and Melanie's relationship, Winterson aim appears to be once again to show the harmful consequences of prejudice and patriarchy, a healthy, mutually fulfilling relationship is needlessly brought to a shuddering halt with one brave malign party subsequently forced to leave home and start life afresh, displaced and disorientated. There are clear parallels made between Jeanette's situation and that of the character Winnet within one of the alternative narratives. Winnet has a positive, heterosexual relationship with a boy, something unsurprisingly largely conspicuous by its absence in the main narrative, only for the sorcerer self-appointed father figure to step in and resort to patriarchal cliches. The boy is thrown into a dungeon and is instructed by Winnet to deny me Blame me for whatever you like. You cannot stand by me, for you cannot stand against him. As with the main narrative, a woman is needlessly forced to act self-sacrificially, simply for acting upon natural impulses, heterosexual or homosexual. The tragedy of this is emphasised through the emotive use of the verb deny, which conjures up connotations of Peter's denials of Jesus in the run-up to the crucifixion. 
Winterson wants to shift our perceptions about women. They can be proactive and have agency, and they can be heroic. The way Jeanette responds to the exposure of her relationship with Katie, as well as the presentation of Winnet and other fantasy figures in the novel, including the woman who refuses to marry the prince, helps facilitate this reshaping of stereotypical views about women. They are capable of as much, if not much more, than their wretched it-y male counterparts. Let's now move on to exploring key themes in the novel, starting with the presentation of religion. This is a biggie. Winterson repeatedly seeks to undermine and deride obsessive religious belief, or at least a particular form of Pentecostal Christianity so beloved of her mother. One way she does this is by presenting Pastor Finch as a theatrical, misogynistic bully, who relishes the sound of his own voice far more than helping his fellow Christians. In Genesis, on hearing that Jeanette is seven, he embarks upon a melodramatic monologue in which he muses upon the role played by the number seven within biblical history, before shifting to dire warnings about the potential impact of the devil. He rants, the demon can return sevenfold. The best can become the worst. This little lily could herself be a house of demons. Notwithstanding the apparently complimentary metaphor of a lily, which, given her thoughts on being called sweet by the man at the post office, the narrator is likely to object to, it is clearly disgracefully inappropriate to suggest to a seven-year-old girl that her body could be riddled with evil spirits. As well as presenting Pastor Finch as ludicrously melodramatic and more interested in rhetoric than common decency, Whitteson interposes his proclamations with comic, humdrum, domestic observations, which make it so much harder to take him and all-consuming religious belief seriously. Following his reference to the Seven Seals, the narrator writes, Seven Seals? I had not yet reached revelations in my directed reading, and I thought he meant some Old Testament amphibians I had overlooked. In addition to this humorous misidentification of the correct meaning of seal, there is also the description of Mrs. Rothwell's spoon, bang in the middle of dire proclamations about the devil. And when Pastor Finch slams the table to emphasise a point, he unwittingly catapulted a cheese sandwich into the collection bag. The effect of these relentless, additional, mundane comic details is to strip back some of the mystique from religious life. Over time, it becomes clear that Winston views religious systems as, to some extent, social constructs, rather than something divinely ordained. Notice the misogyny within Finch's implicit hierarchy when he declares that it has been known for the most holy men to be suddenly filled with evil. And how much more a woman? And how much more a child? Parents, watch your children for the signs. Husbands, watch your wives. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Priests first, by definition men, then other men, then women, then children. Not even a pretense at equality from our pastor Finch. Praise the Lord. The idea of religion being a construct, a product, is furthered through frequent descriptions of the Pentecostal church's use of marketing gimmicks. There is Pastor Spratt's marketing backgrounds. The use of an action kit to save souls. Tricks to get punters to subscribe to the Society for the Lost. And the Del Boy esque battle bus. Here's a few images of this bus from the BBC's 1990 television drama based on the novel. It looks ridiculously garish. And what's the naked man with a large penis all about? It would not be possible to think of a less spiritual, more tacky contraption 
leaving both reader and viewer suspecting that this Pentecostal group may be more about substanceless, slick-ish marketing aimed at the gullible and needy rather than facilitating genuine communion with God. But it isn't just cheese sandwiches being catapulted into collection bags or deaf, hungry old ladies far more interested in eating as opposed to lapping up religious fear-mongering, which makes the reader laugh when presented with religious events and key religious figures. There's the moment the Pentecostal Church's musical group insists on going head-to-head -head with the Salvation Army following a dispute about the use of tambourine players. And what about the moment when, following a glorious week in Blackpool, in which numerous new souls have found the Lord, Mrs Rothwell heads off into the sea with a view towards hastening her relocation to heaven. Under other circumstances, this act would be labelled a suicide attempt and thus potentially result in a more sombre atmosphere. None of that here. With comedy arising from the fact Mrs. Winderson prudishly draws attention to Mrs. Rothwell's underslip showing whilst being rescued. And Fred, the coach driver's grumbling about his lack of recognition for an act usually deemed heroic. What about the watercolour of Jesus hung above the oven in Jeanette's house in which the Lord had a blob of egg on one foot? Throughout the novel, Winterson cannot resist juxtaposing the spiritual with something ridiculous, something from a completely different context, typically ludicrously humdrum, and we are left to laugh at those Pentecostal Christians. Except, of course, as well as the humour, there is the more serious side which relates to the church's militant lack of empathy and barbarous insistence on conformity to very narrow interpretations of how life should be lived. I've already covered to some extent the disgraceful moment when Pastor Spratt takes Jeanette and Melanie by surprise by calling up a weeping Mrs. Whitteson to the front before labelling the pair as having fallen under Satan's spell. However, the way the church behaves subsequently to this is arguably just as shocking. The day after the event, Jeanette returns home after staying at Miss Dewsbury's and finds a prayer meeting taking place. For a staggering 13 and a half hours, the elders of the church remain with Jeanette, praying over me, laying hands on me, urging me to repent my sins. On the one hand, the length of time the senior figures of the church, including the pastor, spend beseeching and praying, does seem to confirm their sincerity. They believe wholeheartedly in God and what they are doing and want to strive mightily in order to save Jeanette's soul. However, this event would have been awful in its intensity, with Jeanette not given a second to herself to think or reflect for herself, which the cynical might argue was part of the entire point. Even worse, when, at 10 o'clock at night, the group leave, the pastor's instructions are Don't let her out of this room and don't feed her. She needs to lose her strength before it can be hers again. Which Mrs. Winterson takes a step further by also removing the room's light bulb. Consequently, Jeanette begins to hallucinate and sees a vision of an orange demon. When feeling ill, she pushed her toes into her mouth for comfort. They tasted of digestive biscuits. The tactics used by the church to bring Jeanette back into line seem more akin to those used illegally on political prisoners in so-called less enlightened countries and are a world away from the kindness and forgiveness preached by Jesus in the New Testament. Of course, the church as a whole, not just Mrs. Winterson, generally come across as Old Testament through and through. The 1990 TV drama goes even further in their presentation of the church group as cruel and inhumane, with Jeanette additionally being bound with cords of love. The original novel doesn't have these cords of love, 
But nonetheless, we are left the impression of a church which can terrify and be abusive in its intensity and its failure to accept even the lighter shades of difference. What's a shame about all this is, of course, that there are times when being in church can be great fun and create a wonderful sense of belonging. In the final section of this video, I'd like to explore the novel's presentation of love and sexuality. It's easy to focus our ire on Mrs. Winterson and her church for their total lack of understanding and empathy in relation to Jeanette's sexuality. But to do so might be a little unfair, given the context in which this novel was published. It was published in 1985, although set in the 1960s and 70s. In 2018, the BBC recorded a short episode for its Witness History series, in which it retold the story of a lesbian protest from 1988. A group of lesbian activists invaded a BBC TV news studio and disrupted a live broadcast, protesting about the introduction of Section 28 of the Local Government Act 1988. As stated within a short history of LGBT rights in the UK within the British Library's website, this act banned local authorities from promoting homosexuality or pretended family relationships and prohibited councils from funding educational materials and projects perceived to promote homosexuality. The legislation prevented the discussion of LGBT issues and stopped pupils getting the support they needed. Within the Witness History episode, Bowen Temple gave the backgrounds. In general, Britain was quite a hostile environment in the 1980s for the LGBT community. About 75% of people when surveyed said that it was mostly or always wrong to be gay. So thinking of oranges are not the only fruits, it is surely right to assume that Mrs. Winterson's and the church's prejudices about sexuality would have been shared or perhaps implicitly condoned by large sections of the wider community. Something difficult for modern readers to fully appreciate. Certainly, the novel explores a broader pressure from society to get married and embrace a conventional heterosexuality. Irrespective of whether this brings any kind of fulfilment, and it generally seems as though it doesn't. In numbers, Jeanette's aunt gives an insight into what happened when she got married. When I married, I laughed for a week, cried for a month and settled down for life. It's different, that's all. They have their little ways. Similarly, Doreen tells Nellie that she didn't know what her husband was when she married him. Her dad had liked him and it seemed sensible. Meanwhile, Mrs. Winterson's ex explanation of why she got married was that we had to have something for you. And besides, he's a good man, though I know he's not one to push himself. The overall abiding sense is that getting married has consistently failed to live up to initial hopes and that many women have had to compromise and settle for a lack of fulfillment in their domestic lives. Certainly the impression is that love or any kind of vibrant passion has been absent from heterosexual marriages for the vast majority of each relationship. As a young girl, Jeanette finds society's implicit suggestion that she will end up marrying a man unsettling and confusing, particularly as she feels that some men can hide their true natures, which are so different from women. This extraordinary quotation needs to be explored and perhaps challenged. On the one hand, is this a young girl's way of trying to balance her own instinctive repulsion towards men? As symbolised in her dream in which her husband-to-be was transformed at the altar, with the fact that everyone expects her to marry a man? 
is the suggestion that some men are savage, non-humans, a way of making her own deep discomfort with the idea of a heterosexual future seem quite reasonable? Or is this quotation pointing to the fundamental differences between men and women? Note the separate paragraphs, not just for the reference to beasts, but also for the two sexes. With such differences, is it therefore logical and right to penalise those who instinctively warm towards similarity and an emotional link? Overall, Winterson paints a bleak picture of heterosexual love in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruits. There is one relatively normal, happy ish heterosexual couple in the novel, the pair who work at the funeral parlour. But you could argue that there are hints that this may not be an entirely satisfactory relationship, as seen in the absence of the woman's name, which may suggest that her female identity becomes eroded by her involvement with Joe, and in the fact that she comes off the man's scooter, causing minor injury. The heroine of the novel longs to experience long-lasting, passionate, vibrant love, but feels that this is an impossibility with a man. Given her views and feelings, it is clearly tragic that her home and church families, and implicitly wider society, are so against her trying to find fulfilment through a same-sex relationship. This has been an A-level spoken on Shakespeare guide to Netflix since Oranges are not the only fruit. Many thanks for watching.